New month, new quarter, new lesson. Welcome to the Teens Cornerstone Connections lesson from the Teens of the Nairobi Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're very happy that you could make it to be here with us today. You should have a lot to look forward to. First off, we're going to have some wonderful music from Amy, and we're going to have the lesson discussion done by our panel, which consists of Sid, Ashley, Misati, and our wonderful teen teacher, Teacher Bridget. So we hope that you enjoy and that you feel at the feet of Jesus. Thank you. Welcome once again to our third quarter this year. Indeed, the year has gone by so fast and we are grateful to God. The theme for our lesson for Cornerstone this quarter is Lying in the Sand. And as we shall be studying this lesson, we'll see why exactly it's entitled Lying in the Sand. But just to give a, a bit of context, Lying in the Sand actually means to set a limit beyond which someone cannot go without suffering serious consequences. So as we study the lesson this quarter, we're going to see why. Why did they choose Line in the Sun? Now joined here, uh, I have three panelists with me, and I'd like each one of them to introduce themselves, starting from my left. My name is Sid, and I'll be taking you through the punchlines and Sabbath. And my name is Ashley, and I'll be taking you through into and out of the story. I am Isati, and I will be providing the lesser light that will guide us to the greater light. Thank you, and I'd like to invite Ashley to start us off with prayer. Let us pray. Our kind and loving Father, our Savior, our Redeemer, and our friend, we come before a throne of mercy, grateful that you have led us this far, and also asking that you may illumine our minds and remove every preconceived idea that as we read your word, you may be open to understand and to listen to the promptings of your spirit. Be with us now for this a humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Ashley. So our lesson today is entitled, The Trust Test. The Trust Test. 
And there's a very interesting photo, if you turn with me to your lessons, whether it's online or if you have a hard copy. There's a very interesting photo that has been put there, and I'm sure most of us have, you know, maybe tried that trust test, where there's, you know, someone behind you, and you're challenged to just fall into their arms. And you know, if, if you're given someone to actually do that for you, you know, you'd have to um, look at them and see um, how is their physique, like are they tall enough, are they strong enough to support me. If it's someone who's smaller than you, for sure you'd, you'd have your doubts, you'd be truly, I just cannot trust that you're going to support this weight. And so we're going to have a look and see, why are we being told that this is a trust test? Time and time again, we've been studying about the Israelites and how they left Egypt. And now they're just about to get into the promised land, which is Canaan. Mm -hmm. A journey that could have taken them about two, roughly two to three weeks, ends up taking them 40 years. <laughs> Currently 38 years. 38 years, this is where we are today. So now we're at 38 years. But eventually it will be 40. And you wonder, why should a two-week journey take you 40 years? And so that's what we are going to be studying today. So I'd like to invite um, Sid to take us through the What Do You Think section. Okay, so we are going to decide, all of us will decide whether you agree or you disagree with the statements. So the first one is God expects us to be 100% certain before we step out and choose to obey him. So I'll go first. I think I'm going to disagree with this because God always, like, he always, he's, he's always willing to give us a second chance, a third chance, even if we, like, we commit sin, he's willing to give us more chances. Ms. Hati, what do you think? I think that um, there's always doubt, and God will never remove every single doubt, but he will give us enough evidence upon which to base our faith. And because of that, we will never be 100% certain. So we just need to um, understand by doing the doctrine. Yeah. yeah, and the thing is, God says, as your day, your strength shall be in measure. Mm. And I don't think you need a hundred percent to go through one day. You may need a certain percentage, but of course God doesn't expect you to do everything all at once, all in one go. So I also disagree with this statement. So the second one says, God expects us to follow him with blind faith in his leading. I am going to agree with this one. Because just like the Israelites who are going who have been traveling for thirty eight years in the desert, Moses has to blindly trust God to lead them through the desert and into the promised land. Um, I would agree, though I would also say that um, truly as Ashley has said, he gives us sufficient evidence for us to base up our faith on. So it's not that he'll just call you and you know you just have to follow him without any evidence at all. There's always something that he's given you for you to actually say, you know what, there's one step I can take. I may not see the entire staircase, but I have that one step. So I can actually take the first step and then other steps will, will just come up subsequently. Any other thoughts maybe on that? I don't think I would call it blind faith mm -hmm. because um, we, walk by faith and not by sight. So it's more of, we see, though not with our physical eyes, but with the eyes of faith. Yeah. yeah. And I believe that faith, or the faith that God requires of us, is never blind. Because mm. I, I see blind faith as someone just doing something without evidence. But God says, taste and know that the Lord is good. He doesn't say eat the whole buffet or eat the whole cake. He says, you know what, just taste. Have a little bit, then trust in the little bit of what you have tasted mm -hmm. and believe that the cake or the rest of the food or the juice tastes as good as what you have already tasted. Yeah. 
And the last one is God expects us to use reason and facts to make our decisions about his will. I'm going to agree with this one because the Bible gives us facts and uh, reason to uh, to uh, reason to make decisions about his will mm, i think um we are intellectual beings and in isaiah 1 8 god says come let us reason together so he gives us the ability to reason and as much as we are carnally minded and our reason may be distorted we are not to totally depend on our reason yeah but if we would think one preacher says as you listen to me think about everything i say don't just follow me blindly because i taught and i said the bible says so as much as yes we need to think our reason may be distorted but god also gives us the ability to discern in fact um, it's isaiah 55 where it says that his ways are not our ways his thoughts are not our thoughts so it means that our thoughts are very different from his but as Ashley has said, he gives us, you know, ability to reason with him. What is written in his word, we have the ability to go and read and think about it and say, is this, does this actually make sense? Yeah, is this in line with God's will? So truly God has given us that ability. Okay, see, so can finish. So uh, which do you think is a more effective way to learn? Learning from others' mistakes or from their good example? Choose one and explain your reasons, and then think of an example. Miss mm-hmm. Ati, why don't you start? Uh, so I think the question is whether it's best to learn from our own mistakes or from the experiences of others. You know, I feel it would be it's actually best best to learn from someone else's experiences. However, there are certain things that your own experience holds more weight than someone else's experience. Mm-hmm. Let me give an example. If God has come through for you, that holds so much weight. Because you're like, God, the high and holy God who lives in, in, a, in an approachable light, decided to make his dwelling place with me and grant me pleasure in this, in this opportunity that is. And I think that holds a lot of weight. weight. When it comes to something that is so intrinsically tied to what you value and what you believe, I feel that your own experience holds more weight. However, when it comes to mistakes, I believe that's why the Bible is full of so many stories. It's like you do this, this happens. You do this in this way, this happens. Mm. You try and switch up the variables, kidogo, if this still happens. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, for mistakes, it's best to learn from others. Mm. Yeah, the one person said that the wise learn from other people's mistakes, but the fool waits to make his own mistakes. Mm. But you know, there are things that if you make the mistakes, you might never live long enough to make the right decision after that mistake. For instance, if you take poison, you'll die. Will you wake up and say, oh, you know what, that was poison. I will mm. never take it again. Yeah. It's not possible. So it's best to learn from other people's mistakes. Amen. That's true. So in um, the lesson, we're given a story. There's a story told of someone who's called Houdini. So Houdini was a locksmith. A locksmith is someone who is able to make and to repair any locks of doors. So it so happened that Houdini was known to be among the best locksmiths. So he could go to any jail cell and he was able to open it and he could escape. So there's, in England, there's a certain city where they decided, you know what, so we're going to make this jail cell and we're going to make sure that no one is able to escape from here. And so they said to test it, we're going to call this Houdini and see if he's able to break away or break out of it. So he says, I have two conditions. You have to give me my privacy, complete privacy. I don't want any security. And two, you let me get in with my civilian clothes. So they let him do that. Those two conditions are satisfied. So he goes in. So he goes in and he sits alone So under his belt, he had a rod that he used to use to get into the the hole of the lock. So he tries to unlock for hours and hours and hours on end, and he gets so tired that he eventually falls. So he falls against the door, and the door 
just opens. And to his surprise, the door had been unlocked that whole time. And you know, he was like, oh my goodness. Why didn't I think of this before? I've spent so many hours and here the door was unlocked. And so the point of this story that I want to bring is that sometimes we always try to do things our own way before seeking God's way. So you see, like for him, the door was already unlocked, but he was trying to do what he was always used to doing. Yeah? So that's part of the lesson that we're going to learn from our story today. And so I'm going to invite Ashley to take us into the story as we proceed. Um, our story today comes from Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 1 to 14, and I'll read it. Then we turned back and set to out toward the wilderness along the route to the Red Sea as the Lord had directed me. For we, for a long time we made our way around the hill country of Seir. Then the Lord said to me, You have made your way around this hill country long enough. Now turn north. Give the people these orders. You are about to pass through the territory of, the le of your relatives, the descendants of Esau, who live on Seir. They will be afraid of you, but be careful. Do not provoke them to war, for I will not give you any of their land, not even enough to put your foot on. I have given Esau the hill country of Seir as his own. You are to pay them in silver for the food and the water that you drink. The Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He has watched over your journey through this vast wilderness. These 40 years the Lord your God has been with you and you have not lacked anything. So we went on past our relatives, the descendants of Esau who live in Seir, and we turned from the Arba Road which comes up from Elath and Ezion Gaba and traveled along the desert, of, the desert road of Moab. Then the Lord said to me, Do not harass the Moabites nor provoke them to war, for I will not give you any part of their land. I have given Ar to the descendants of Lot as a possession. The Amites used to live there, a people strong and numerous and as tall as the, Amalek, the Anakites. Like the Anakites, they, were too, they too were considered Rephites, but the Moabites called them Amites. Horites used to live in Seir, but the descendants of Esau drove them out. They destroyed the Horites before them and settled in their place, just as Israel did in the land that the Lord gave them as their possession. And the Lord said, Now get up and cross the, the Red Valley. So we crossed the valley. Thirty-eight years had passed from the time we left Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the, the Red Valley. By then, that entire generation of fighting men had perished from the camp as the Lord has sown to them. Amen. Thank you, Ashley, for taking us through that. Um, so that was from Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 1 to 14. However, I'd encourage you to read the entire of chapter 2 and chapter 3 as well so that you get more context into this story. Now, it's interesting that um, God told us in the Bible that there are only two people who left Egypt who are going to make it to the promised land. Yeah, and that's Joshua and Caleb, which means that everyone else who left Egypt died in the wilderness. Yeah, and that's what we are seeing. So basically, these people we are seeing here, it's a new generation of people. All the others have died. So these people are just about to take over or to inherit the promised land, which is Canaan. And so there are some people that they have to pass through their land. And as we had seen even from um, last week's lesson, um, for example, the land of Edom, yeah, where the descendants of Esau lived, they had to pass through their land. But remember how the descendants of Esau told them, um, you know, we, we won't let you pass through this land. And so they had to go around, which even took them more time. And we can see in today's story, they're going through um, the land of other people. And God tells them, you know, these people don't fight with them. I will let them give you the chance to go through this land. But there are some people, if you read chapter 3, whom they had to fight and they had to conquer their land. Mm -hmm. 
And so um, we'll see how God uh, used them. God, God promises them that they're going to conquer, despite them not even having the warfare, despite them not having prepared for battle, but it's just a show of trust. So God is testing their faith to see if they believe him. Are they ready to inherit this promised land? There's just so much that God can do for you, but there's also that bit that you need to do to show that indeed you trust God. So there's a part there in the did you know section that says, um, maybe Sid, you could read for us the did you know part. Okay. Um, did you know that the uh, several groups of big people are referred to in the Bible? Nephilim existed very early in human history. Rephaim occupied the land prior to the Canaanites. Anakim lived in the south near Hebron and were defeated by the Israelites under Joshua. Emim, a warrior, a warrior tribe of giants that were defeated by Chedorlaomer Chedor, Chedor and his allies around the, the time of Abraham. Yes, so we can see that these Israelites, actually it's like they were taken back to where the, 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 the ancestors, or let me say their predecessors, had been before. Mm -hmm. So it's like they're being given the same test mm -hmm. that their ancestors had been given before. Yeah. And so it goes on to say, how big were the giants the Israelites faced? Moses says, we saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers. Can you imagine? You know, when we were small, we used to catch grasshoppers and put them in boxes and, you know, feed them with grass. And you can imagine someone being compared to grasshoppers. Oh, my. So he says that we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. Why might the ten spies have said this? In any case, the enemy was unmistakably large, making the miracle of God's victory equally large. So to me, what I'm seeing here is that God made them go through the same, same experience that their predecessors had gone through to test them and see, did they learn? Did they learn from what their ancestors went through? Are they ready? Are they prepared to occupy this promised land? So we can do out of the story, Ashley. Um, just before we do out of the story, I'd like to add on to what you said, and I'd say that this happens to us in our lives. We go through the same temptations until we are able to overcome them. And if we fail, the Lord has to make us pass through that road again. So the faster we pass the test, the better for all, the better for all of us. Yeah. Um, before entering the promised land, this is the question. Why do you think God made the Israelites wander and wait 38 years before coming back to this pivotal point? So I think the thing is, okay, the first aspect, though it was slightly cruel, mm -hmm. is I think God wanted to kill off just enough of them. Or he wanted to ensure that the generation that had partaken in that sin was eliminated, that is. Or in other words, he wanted to make sure that the ones who had muscle memory in committing, muscle memory in committing the sin were not there. That's one aspect. The other aspect would be, of course, God says that he punishes three to four generations mm -hmm. and then they are hereditary sins. Yeah. And I think God just wanted to give them enough time to prepare for the supplementary. That is, if you're given a test and you fail it, you're not given another test the following day, so to speak. You're given some time just to compose yourself and mm -hmm. take the test. Mm -hmm. So God wanted to be fair because he's a just and fair God. Amen. And also just to say that um, their unbelief in God just made them waste so much time because anytime they did not believe then God would take them through a test to make them think about their lives again mm -hmm. and so it really took them so so long for them to get to Canaan. And how is this applicable in our lives today? Are we going around in circles? Are we delaying the coming of the Lord? Peter says that Christ that God does not delay his promises, many count him slack, but he's not willing that any of us should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Are we delaying the work by not 
asking God for, the for, for forgiveness of our sins and working daily, moment by moment, to overcome the things that easily beset us. And the next question would be, how do you think the Israelites felt when faced with the challenge that their forefathers had failed 40 years before? Sid, what do you think? What do you think? How would you feel if you were to be put under the same circumstances your grandfather was? If you were to apply this today, mm-hmm. a lot of people would say, uh uh-uh, uh, why are you putting me through this? Mm-hmm. Didn't my ancestors already go through this? Mm-hmm. But see, the Israelites, mm-hmm. like if, if I was one of them, I would feel like, you know, the, uh, our ancestors have gone through it. Mm-hmm. We are going through it. Will, our gene- will the next generation go through it? And like that, like that. I, would, I think that um, because your ancestors went through it and they did not pass this, this test, and after listening to history and all that happened, you'd be more eager to go through this and have a breakthrough, and you'd be, you'd be thinking of it as, if I can go through this, that my child and my generations after me do not go through this, I will brave myself out and pass this test. So to our parents and to us as well. Mm -hmm. Um, One person once said that the things that you do now, your children will, you do now moderately, your children will do in excess. It will be magnified. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what is it that we, what are the things that we cultivate in our day-to-day lives that are going to be passed on to the next generation? And how can we, by our habits, ensure that the next generation does not fight with the sins that we are fighting with now. Mm. Mm. Amen. I remember when I was in high school, there was a topic in chemistry. So I did chemistry. Mm -hmm. So when we were in Form 2, we were told that when you get to Form 3, there's a topic called moles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure if you did 844 and you did chemistry, there's a topic called moles. And we were told moles is a very hard topic. In fact, just prepare yourself to fill that topic. Because okay. many people had failed it before. Of course, they, they are the chosen few who had passed it. So by the time we were in Form 2 and almost transitioning to Form 3, we were just thinking, oh my God, are we going to make it through this? Mm-hmm. So we said, you know, we're going to put in a lot of effort just to make sure that when we get there, we don't fail like those who have failed Passed. before. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking maybe even these Israelites, having heard that, you know, in our, our fathers failed this test, you know, then why don't we ask God to guide us through this test that he's subjecting us to again, yeah, so that they can be able to overcome it. And even as we said in the what do you think section, it's important and it is wise for us to learn from others' mistakes. Yeah, so that's, that's it. Mm-hmm. So um, the, what is the central point, the central lesson taught in this story? I guess... Following God's command would save us a lot, and following His command, like keeping God's commandments, benefits us. And the difficulties that fill us with dread will vanish as soon as we move forward in the path of obedience, humbly trusting God. So, God knows that it's not easy, He sympathizes with our difficulties as much as he does give us strength to obey him as we walk this road. Yeah. Amen. Just before I invite um, Misati to take us through the flashlight, um, I want us to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 7, which is the key text for our lesson today. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 7, which says, The Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He has watched over your journey through this vast wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you, and you have not lacked anything. To me, it is a mystery that when the Israelites were starting their journey from Egypt, all they had was, remember, they had borrowed jewels of gold and silver from the Egyptians, and they had um, just eaten the Passover. And, of course, they had just some few clothes, 
that would take them for, you know, the prospective two to three weeks that they were supposed to go on. Now, you know, if I was to ask you, um, when you're traveling, you always, the first question you ask is, where are we going? Mm -hmm. And how many days are we going for? So that you know, okay, I need to pack X amount of clothes. But these people, thinking that they, the journey would be short, probably didn't even have as many clothes, for example. They were like, okay, we're going for two to three weeks, so we just need X amount of clothes, for example. Yeah. But here they are roaming for 40 years. And it's a mystery how their sandals didn't wear off. Their clothes were not torn. Mm -hmm. Whenever they, they would complain that they're lacking water or food, God would always provide. When it was cold at night, as it tends to get really cold in the wilderness, God had, you know, the fire. During the day, he would have the cloud to shelter them from all this heat. And it's, it's just a mystery. And it's amazing how through all these 40 years, God walked with them. And, you know, it's, it's for us to think about and wonder, if God walked with them all these 40 years, what about us in our daily lives? Do we start to question God in the simplest of things? You know, why is this thing going like this and why not like this person? We look at others and they're doing better than us and we're like, why is person X doing better than me? So our lesson today is encouraging us that God truly works with us. And if we look at how he has led us in the past, then we should be careful to truly trust him even in future events. So I'd like to invite Misati to give us more insights on this lesson. So patriarchs and prophets chips in, and I shall read in your hearing. It says that everyone who seeks to follow the path of duty will at times be assailed by doubt and unbelief. They will sometimes be so barred by obstacles apparently insurmountable as to discern those who will, will yield to discouragement. But God is saying to such, go forward, do your duty at any cost. The difficulties that seem so formidable, that fill your soul with the dread, will vanish as you move forward in the path of obedience, humbly trusting in God. And I see right here that it has struck me that the Israelites asked for what they needed in the wrong way. God instructs us to ask him in faith. So instead of the Israelites, for example, when they reached a place where they needed water, instead of complaining like, hey, God, like, why have you taken us from there? And why have, you come, why have you brought us to the desert where there is no water and there is no food and we are starving? I think they could have asked in faith. How would that have sounded like? They would have asked, when will we stop to get a water break? Where or when are we going to eat our supper? I mean, so, I mean in essence, they are asking in faith, you see. And I think that's, that's how we should begin asking God. That even when we face difficulties, instead of saying like, God, why me? It's like, when will this end? Mm -hmm. Or I am ready to endure this for I know the plans that you have for me and the thoughts you think Towards toward me. You. Amen. Yeah. And to tie this in, Thursday presents us with an interesting idea. We have had the adage that the devil is in the details, but God is also in the details. That is, because God is there in the smallest things. Often, the things that God does for us aren't like humongous things. Or he does small things in big ways. Because if we were ever to be critical with ourselves and ask ourselves what made that experience, what made an experience exceedingly amazing for you, it would be that something small. Mm. Maybe someone complimented something you are wearing or someone was there for you or someone was there to hear you out. Those mm -hmm. small things. Mm -hmm. And I see that's where God usually comes in. Mm -hmm. And that's how God is in the details. Even though the devil may try and pass into the details, you know. But God is there and that is where he originally is. You know, we, we, we kind of have this thought that God is superficial. And he only deals with the big things of life. He doesn't care about our convenience or whether we like things or not. But we forget the fact that God is the one who created us, the personalities we have, the specific, the specif the, the fact that you specify the little bit of details and say, I can't wear that color. There's nothing wrong with it, but you just can't. That's just not me. Yeah. So as much as, yes, God is a God of big things, he's also a God of details, and he also loves to 
dwell on the small things. Look at the petals of the flower. There are some petals that are different color. Who made them in those very details? So we can trust God even with the tiny bitiest details of our lives. Amen, amen. What beautiful insights. So I'd like to invite um, maybe Misati to read for us Psalms chapter 22 verse 4. And even as he's preparing to read that for us, I'd just like us to brainstorm. You know, the Bible is a, a book that is filled with so many characters who have shown leaps of faith. For example, if you remember the story of Naaman, Naaman had leprosy. Now, if you, if you study the science of leprosy, <laughs> it's, not, it's not a disease that any of us would want to have. Mm -hmm. And remember the treatment, quote-unquote, that he was told is to go and dip yourself seven times in the River Jordan. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I'm thinking he went in the first time and he was like, no, 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 I cannot do this any, please. Any longer. One is enough. It was muddy. It's too much. So he, he, didn't, he, he said, okay, fine. I need to get better. So I'll go in the second time. And it was even worse than the first. But anyway, eventually he got to the seventh and he was cleansed and we are told that, you know, his skin was like that of a baby. Yeah. And so um, we have so many characters. Take, for example, the time when the Israelites were beaten by the fiery serpents. Now, also being beaten by a serpent, you know, um, there's, there's all that science that happens where um, your coagulation cascade is activated and eventually you're going to start bleeding. You'll, you'll start bleeding really profusely and your blood pressure will go really low. So I'm thinking that, you know, they were told that you need to look upon that bronze serpent and maybe they didn't even have that energy. They were like, you know, maybe their eyes were closed and they were so weak and so tired and they're being told, look at that bronze serpent and you'll be saved. So it wasn't an easy task. It had to be a look of faith. And so maybe, Misati, you can read for us Psalms 22, verse 4, so that um, we get what insights they have for us there. So Psalms 22, 4 tells us, Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. And for those two stories you gave, something just struck me as quite interesting. Taking the example of the serpent, for example. Someone's bitten by a snake, and then you tell them, Oh, look at that. I look at another snake, and this other snake will stop your blood from coagulating. Idea. Someone just sits down and asks, like, God, are you serious? Are you, are you serious here? I'm supposed to look at a piece of metal shaped like a snake and I'll be okay. And then the case of Naaman. River Jordan, we know, was a very dirty river. So the man had leprosy, mm -hmm. but he also had his own, like, his, his own pride, his own ego. And then I'm considering that if River Jordan was like the Nairobi River we see here, mm -hmm. Then I'm like, hey, Naman, Naman had to have a lot of morale because that mm. it's like he's, he, he's told that if you do this, you become clean. But it's like, why should I throw myself in dirty, in dirty water for me to be clean? I could have been told, go back home, get like a nice clean lake and just go deep, deep, deep. I think even Naman would have gone swimming because he's like, this is nice. In fact, he reasoned that yeah. when he said, I mean, I come all the way from Damascus and you're telling me to dip myself in this muddy river. Don't I have good, beautiful rivers back at home? So, as much as yes, we are supposed to reason out. But sometimes we cannot reason out, and it sounds foolish. Look at us, you know, we believe in a Christ we've never seen. It sounds foolish, but because we have the evidence of faith that everyone who, is, who meets Christ walks in the in the same way, you encounter Christ, you all can shut on Sabbath. You encounter Christ, your life changes and we conform to the similitude of heaven. That is evident enough to base our faith as much as it might seem ridiculous in the eyes of men. Yeah. Men. So I'd like to invite Sid to take us through the punchlines for today. So... For the punchlines, we'll each pick uh, we'll each pick a punchline that speaks to us. Maybe you have a, a friend who you know fa that faces a challenge uh, that seems impossible. So for me, I would pick. I can do all this through Him who gives me strength. 
that's Philippians 4.13. And uh, someone that I know that faces a challenge is my sister. She has challenge with physics. Physics is very difficult for her. And uh, she, she always, she's, every before each physics exam, she's always like, oh, God, God is going to help me pass this exam. God is going to help me pass this exam. So, yeah. Amen. I, I stick with Psalms 22 verse 4, which we've just read, that says, In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. And it's just an assurance to me that uh, from times past, God has been faithful, and he does not change. To this day, he will still be faithful. No matter what obstacle you're going through, no matter what challenge it is that he's taking you through, he's taking you through that challenge for your, test to, uh, for your faith to be tested. Um, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you have you are receiving the end result of your faith the salvation of your souls that first that is first Peter 1 8 and 9 and it is true that obedience brings joy so we are already receiving the end result which is inexpressible joy and glorious joy for the end result of our faith and the salvation of our souls. So I'd encourage every one of us. It might be difficult to start on the path of obedience, but once you experience the joy, um, I think a year or so ago, I was going through challenges and I was thinking, you know, why would you, where do I have to be? I can just, I mean, get lost, I'll enjoy life for a season and then get lost at the end. And then I came across this quote in Mind, Character, and Personality that says, once you taste the goodness of the Lord, nothing else will satisfy you in life until Amen. you go back to Christ. So you will never really find satisfaction after you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good unless you keep, you keep, you keep yourself stayed in God. So for the joy that is and the fulfillment of God's promises, I'd encourage us to keep obeying, yeah. yeah. And some may trust in chariots, some may trust in horses, some may trust in nuclear weaponry, but we will trust <laughs> in, in the, the name Lord. of the Lord. Amen. And that is, yeah. Amen. So just to wind up, Ashley, if you don't mind, you could read for us um, further insight. The further insight. Faith is trusting God, believing that he loves us and knows what is best for our good. In order to strengthen faith, we must often bring in it in contact with the word. Amen. We must often bring our faith in contact with the word of God. Mm -hmm. And that's why we are here, studying the word of God. You know, sometimes we forget, but when you go back to the word of God, it reminds you that he has done it before for so many others. Why shouldn't he do it for you? Mm. And just to conclude, as at the start we sang, a, so, um, a song was played by one of our teens, Amy, that was entitled, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. In light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days. Almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. And so just in line with our title of the lesson, The Trust Test, I want to challenge you to try God's way first before you try your own way. Try that even in the simplest of things. Try God's way first before you try your own way, and you will see a difference. So I'd like to invite Sid to close for us with prayer. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come before you this beautiful Sabbath morning. We thank you for this wonderful day that you have given unto us. We pray that all the people watching have understood the lesson and that uh, they may glorify your name for this and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Join us next Sabbath as we shall be studying about greed, the bottomless pit.